Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Richard Woolman, and I am going to be doing a talk on testing your test with code coverage. Um, I don't think I need to go over why we do bother doing testing. Um, we're all aware of the benefits of testing, and we're all ashamed enough to pretend that we do testing even if we don't. However, it's um, undeniable that most developers find writing new code more fun than writing test suites. Um, writing test suites is also extremely dependent on the skills of the person writing them. It takes a lot of energy, mental energy, to think through all of the different code execution paths and possible event um, conditions and to be able to write tests to catch those. Uh, and this level of fatigue can obviously mean that you miss potential issues. Uh, there's also uh, the perception that writing tests, uh, in particular writing complete tests, provides little or no benefit to the final product. Uh, the end users, uh, managers, are usually more interested in new features rather than stability, and less stability becomes at uh, cost of those new features. Uh, nobody likes an unstable product, but then it, people don't like waiting ages for a product to come out because the tests haven't been written. But one main concern is that when writing tests, there is usually no, the tests themselves are usually not uh, themselves inspected for quality. Um, it's difficult to go through somebody's test to make sure that they are covering all of the new code uh, and are not in writing new tests accidentally, uh, or sorry, in writing new code accidentally uh, created dead spots in the code that the existing tests no longer cover. As an example, I've got a small library class here that would be under test. Um, for the purposes of this presentation, I've made it very simple. Um, I've also had to split the code across two columns um, to make the font readable. On the left, we just have standard uh, boilerplate for object creation, a constructor, constructor with parameter, and a destructor. Uh, and on the right-hand side, I have defined three functions. Um, the F function is simply three different uh, execution paths, um, quite simple, once again, for the purposes of demonstration, and two additional functions, G and H, that don't do a great deal. Uh, once again, these aren't intended to do anything particularly special. They're simply to demonstrate how testing with code coverage can show you where code is not being executed. The test case itself is also extremely simple. Uh, we include the test library, we instantiate it, we create an object um, without the constructor, so we use the default constructor. Um, I'm then calling the F function twice with two different parameters and exiting early. Uh, So when we're building our application, uh, our test suite um, for testing, GCC has uh, a couple of options that you would need to add into your um, compile statements in order to enable the profiling of um, profiling of the code during execution. There are two compile time options that need adding and one link time option, but GCC does have a convenience option that covers all of those. Um, here we can see at the bottom I've got a make command, I've included everything in make file, um, and I use the shortened coverage version to ensure that it is consistent across the two compile steps and the linking step. Once you've done your compilation and linking, there are new files created um, for each of the source code files. These match up the runtime instrumentation to the source code lines. Um, there is one for every source code file that you would compile, um, and they are placed next to the object files rather than next to the source files. Um, and as I say, they map the source code line numbers to the compiled blocks to make them possible to check once the execution has been completed. To actually generate the test code, uh, sorry, the test data, uh, you would run your application as you would normally. All of the instrumentation for coverage has been compiled into the um, application. 
and will automatically run as you run it. You can also run your test suite multiple times. The output from code profiling is cumulative. Uh, so you can run the same test suite against different input parameters. Uh, you may have different input files that need testing. You may have different networking setups that need testing. Uh, and in order to make sure you have a good idea of your complete code coverage, um, the code coverage system will um, code coverage system will accumulate all of the runtime information into the single file. The new file that's created, um, once again, is placed alongside the object file. Um, these files can also be configured at the compile time to be stored in another location, but the default is to have them next to the notes file that was created that maps the source code to the um, compile blocks and also the um, object files themselves. These files contain the runtime information. Um, they record the entry and exit into each function, um, but they also record the line level execution. So unlike uh, code profiling, where you are given a report based on which functions were exited or entered and exited, with the code coverage report, you actually get a line level uh, report of which lines were executed. Um, and as I've said, the results are cumulative. So multiple runs will increase the counts of executed lines rather than replace them. Um, this obviously is useful if you do have multiple test scenarios, multiple test files, or multiple test environments in order to run your tests under. Once you've run your test application and you have these um, output files with the raw data in, you would want to, you need to process these data files to provide a um, coverage report. Each of the output files, the um, execution files, need to be run separately, and the would they are run based against their source file. Uh, this is why they need to know where you have compiled your notes file and your data files uh, in order to provide the report. It immediately covers, it immediately returns the coverage percentage. Um, as you can see here on the third line, our test application only executes 55.56% of our um, library class. And in addition to this overview, uh, which can be useful to put into continuous integration systems in order to trigger a report of the annotated source file, um, it does generate a second file, which is the annotated source file which is looking like this. Once again, I've had to split the output into two columns in order to make it large enough to read. Um, and the annotated source file is very much similar to your input source file. Um, so my mouse, here we go. So we have our code as written. Uh, the middle column is the line number, which makes it extremely easy to map where to look for holes in your code coverage. And in every case, we have this left-hand column. There is metadata at the top, tells us the source file, uh, and also the notes and the data file. It keeps account of how many runs were made. So if you do run your test suite multiple times, um, it will let you know. If you only intended to run it once, then obviously you can check that to make sure that runs is equal to one. Um, if you intended it, roll, intended it to run multiple times, because you have multiple test scenarios, that should obviously equal the number of test runs you had. The main interesting part of the code coverage report is the left-hand column. And it will be one of three things, non-executable lines, um, comments, uh, punctuation, all have the dash sign in. Um, that indicates that they are non-executable. Executable lines will have the number of times each line has been run. Uh, and in this case, we can see that the constructor, the non-parameter constructor, was run once. Uh, and I called function f twice with two different values. Um, and the two values, the if statement was run twice, but the two values were different, in which case we can see that we returned 100 because our first parameter was greater than 100, and we returned our incoming parameter because it was less than 50. I'm sorry, less than equal to 50. 
but the interesting part of the code coverage report and the one part that is generally more interesting than all the others are these lines with the hashes in. These lines indicate where these, where these particular pieces of code were not executed at all during our test case. So in our simple test scenario, we didn't call the constructor with a parameter. Um, the destructor was obviously called because we created an object. Um, we didn't pass a value into f between 50 and 100. We also never called the g function and we never called the h function. Based on this code report, we can see straight away that our test suite is insufficient because there are obviously parts of code that have never been executed on our test suite. And it's likely to be in these parts of the code where we are going to find errors at runtime that we don't expect. So the benefits of code coverage, it ensures the completeness of the test suite. Um, as we can see, it makes it extremely obvious where there were gaps in our test suite. Um, as I say, writing tests are extremely difficult. The mental load in order to consider every single test case is quite difficult, uh, and it's easy to miss, particularly in extremely complicated code execution paths. Um, it also provides a quantitative manner in which to show that your test suite is complete. Um, although having tests at all is sometimes considered to be enough, uh, it's difficult to provide a quantitative um, statement saying that our tests are complete. Um, having said that, although the goal is to achieve 100% coverage in our test suites, uh, sometimes that's not achievable. There are some cases where failure conditions are so rare or so difficult to trigger that they cannot be triggered um, within a test suite. Um, as a result, it may be that it is acceptable for some tests to actually have less than 100% code coverage. And after you have gone through all of your code and decided which parts are reasonable and which parts are um, outliers in terms of code execution paths, then you potentially have redundant code in your code base that can be removed. Um, this may be because the various logical conditions within execution paths completely forbid um, a particular selection of code from executing. Um, as it's unreachable code, it can be removed. Um, and once again, old dead code functions that are no longer called, um, particularly with development over time, as the inside of code changes, it may be that the logical conditions do eventually cause parts of code to be no longer accessible. Um, and once again, our code testing coverage would uh, show that. So in short, write your codes and tests as normal. Um, the only thing you need to do differently is to build your test suites with the coverage options enabled. Um, you would then run your test suites as normal. Uh, and the next um, different step is to generate the code coverage reports. Uh, these can be generated automatically as part of your CI pipeline. Um, and as I say, with the percentage report given immediately, uh, the CI system may decide to take the code coverage report and um, store it as part of the build output artifacts to um, indicate which of the annotated source files have less than 100% coverage. Um, and then the final step is to take any actions if your code coverage um, in your test suite is not 100%. Uh, that action may be to go back and inspect your test suite to add additional tests to bring it up to 100% or simply to accept that certain areas of the code will never be executed or be so rarely executed that it is acceptable to ignore the fact that it's not 100%. Okay, any questions? So there are, yeah, um, I've got a, more of a comment that there are two different uh, applications, LCOV and GenHTML, that can be used to generate the ports as HTML. Um, I believe that the GCOV command can also output JSON output as well as um, other formats. So uh, you do have options there, but as the commenter said, there are additional um, applications that can use these 
uh, GCDA and the GCNO files in order to generate prettier reports. Um, no further questions on the Q&A. There's nothing on Discord, and I don't think there's anything in the chat. How do you enforce coverage in practice? That's That all depends on your workflow. Uh, oh, sorry, and there's uh, Jenkins has a GCOV plugin. Yeah, so Jenkins, obviously, continuous integration pipeline system. Um, how do you enforce coverage in practice? If you do have a continuous integration system, um, then you would add the you would add the checking of your code coverage reports after the test suites have been run. So if the test suites themselves fail, then there's no point running the coverage reports because you have a bigger problem to solve. Um, but if the test suites apparently complete successfully, um, you could then run the code coverage report generators to ensure that your um, your test suite coverage is as close to 100% as you uh, could possibly expect. Um, and you could get Jenkins or your continuous integration system to either warn or fail the build if the except if the level of coverage is unacceptable. Um, got more things coming in. Uh, L cover gen HTML. Um, yeah, how do you integrate into CMake? Um, I don't actually use CMake myself. I'm too old. I still use GNU Make, um, but it would be a step after the test suite, or it would be included within the test suite um, to ensure that once you've run your test application to process the source files again and to uh, get the reports, I'm not aware of any direct integration with CMake. Okay, another question coming in. What if your test is the only user of a code block? In production, it is not used anymore and effectively redundant. Um, and that's a very good question. Your test suites can obviously keep redundant code alive on the basis that um, because they are reported in the test suite, there is one user of the test suite. Apparently, C-Test has a code coverage. Um, sorry. How do you make sure that in production, the simple answer is you can't. Um, if you believe that it's no longer used in production, then you can remove it. Um, your test will fail, but the, sorry, the coverage would report only one execution or as many execution as your run, but it would report no more than your uh, test runs. I'm sorry, that's a, a bit of a rubbish answer. Uh, but the short answer is there's no easy way to ensure that code is only being kept alive in your test suite and not in production. Are there any more questions coming through? Okay, I don't think there's any more questions. So I'll thank you for your time. <laughs>